I like the fact that we only get to see Toph's reaction to the meteorite crashing after it hits the ground. And even she was like, oh shit, that was serious. Hey, check it out. It's one of the few times we actually get to see Sokka use his second club he got from his dad last season. Obviously because he basically replaces it this episode. It also has like this squirrel tail little dangly bit attached to it that I never noticed before until right now. I wonder what kind of animal that's from. This is some good old fashioned creative avatar bending application that we haven't actually seen for a couple episodes. Like I wouldn't have thought to stamp this out like this. Thank God we're back on track and away from this stuff. You can actually see Toph kind of dart along with this big earth slab as it moves as well. This bending feat always kind of weirded me out. Like Aang just turns this water to snow, which seems weird. It's usually ice, right? But there was one time where Paku actually turned water into a snow lake state. So I guess this tracks. I guess waterbenders could just do that. You're a disgrace. <laughs> I really love this scene. This is Iroh practicing what he preaches. In the darkest time, hope is something you give yourself. That's the meaning of inner strength. He knows he'll get through this. And it also highlights his lack of pride, something that dominates the rest of the royal family to a detrimental effect. He doesn't care if this random dickhead guard thinks he's an insane, ravenous, fat old man. He himself knows that he's not, and that's enough for him. And he actually uses that to his advantage in the future. God, Iroh's awesome. I was gonna ask what Aang was eating, considering he's a vegetarian, but then I looked over and it looks like Toph is just eating a pile of of rocks, so you're good, Aang. I mean, look at Katara's hair, right? What's up with that? That's true, actually. How does she get it to be in those weird, perfect, long sausage shapes? Each of you is so amazing and so special, and I'm not. I'm just the guy in the group who's regular. I'm really glad they decided to give this some time. Of course Sokka would feel like this eventually. We all feel like this at some point, and I think this episode has a really important message to the people that don't naturally excel at something they deem cool or important. And I think Sokka is such a well-rounded character because he has these moments where everyone can be like, of course he feels like this, he's the guy that's just regular, because he is. But even before we get into the scenes of the gang missing him, we already know he fills an important role. He just needs to be reminded of it. A lot of really cool character stuff in this episode. What do you think? Pretty slick, huh? Another avatar myth for you. Apparently this gag was included because the creators got a note that they wanted Aang to wear armor so they could make a toy out of it. You know, toy sales are a big thing. Anyway, apparently the writers thought that idea was dumb as hell, declined it, and then included this joke to make fun of it. Or so the legend goes. All I need to complete the outfit is a wind sword. What's a wind sword? It's where I get a sword handle. And then I just swing this around and bend air out like a blade. Wait, so you do have a wind sword then, right? You're holding a sword hilt right now. Outfit complete. Also, we've got some stylized faces for knee pads. The helmet is obviously modeled after a dragon. But is this pauldron an actual skull, do you think? And if so, Jesus, what is that thing? And my final note on the armor is, isn't it a little interesting that they have all this gear in a size to fit a 100 pound 12 year old? That's weird, right? <laughs> Yeah, Sokka really likes the look of this ornate sheath, but the shop owner comes up and says he has a good eye. A good eye for sheaths? He hasn't even seen the sword. That's an original from Pian Dao, the greatest sword master and sword maker in Fire Nation history. He lives in the big castle up the road from here. I think we can actually see Pian Dao's castle in an earlier establishing shot of the town right here. Might just be another different big building though. This sheath looks to be alarmingly different in this shot compared to its first showing 20 seconds ago. Sokka takes the sword fully out of the scabbard in this shot, but then in the next shot we still get sharp sounds that would probably indicate Sokka was taking the sword out just then. It would be but he already had it out, which means the sword just made this sound as he raised it up a little. How else are you gonna know that it's sharp? Yeah, it's about that time. Can I help you? I'm just gonna play that back in slow motion so we have it on record. Nice. I like that Pian Dao just has a sword next to him as he does his day-to-day -day stuff. Like, whatever he's doing here, painting or calligraphy, it really enforces the fact that he's a master. Being a swordsman is a big part of his life, even when he's just chilling. Subtle environmental stuff like this can really get across into a viewer's mind, even if they don't realize it. And it adds up and paints a really nice picture of a character. And I know one thing for sure. I have a lot to learn. I love this moment, man. Sokka's come so far in these past two seasons. Exactly two seasons ago, Sokka walked into the Kyoshi Warriors Dojo with this cocky attitude, so unaware of how small of a fish he was in the pond. That was a really good episode for him, but it's really nice to see that over the rest of his journeys, all the crazy stuff he's seen, he's noticed that he's a master of nothing, and he's very humble about it, and shows a great amount of humility here. And that's an awesome trip that we got to go on with him. And obviously, Pian Dao likes it too. You get the vibe that he's dealt with a lot of people that waltzed into his castle with the same cocksure attitude that Sokka did with the Kyoshi Warriors. Let me guess. 
You've come hundreds of miles from your little village where you're the best swordsman in town, and you think you deserve to learn from the master. So Sokka throwing himself at his feet with great humility is probably a huge breath of fresh air. And you get all of that from only a few seconds of animation and great voice acting. And I think that's incredible. If you look around Piantao's estate, you'll actually see that he has a ton of lion turtle statues sitting around. Pretty cool. Sokka's been in charge of the schedule. I'm not sure what we should be doing. Oh, the schedule. You bring up the schedule. The schedule that almost had you having bathroom breaks and meal breaks at the same time. The schedule that was in dire need of following. How exactly did Sokka work in a couple days of training with Piantao into that schedule? Is it because the schedule doesn't matter at all, actually? Is it? Get there, Iroh! When you write your name, you stamp the paper with your identity. You must learn to use your sword to stamp your identity on a battlefield. That's a really cool lesson. Once again, Avatar stresses the mental side of fighting, the philosophy behind it, not just the physical aspects, which by this point, you know, is one of my favorite things about the show. Between shots here, the paper that P and Dao laid out for Sokka, as well as the desk, seem to get way longer. Sokka goes in to write his name here with his right hand, but we've been shown before that Sokka writes, or at least draws, with his left hand. I'll give it to him and say that he's ambidextrous. That seems like a Sokka kind of thing. Remember, you cannot take back a stroke of the brush or a stroke of the sword. Bars peeing out? Oh shit. This is a super nitpick, but Sokka starts to stress out here. Sweat appears on his face, but when he takes a second to think, the sweat is just reabsorbed into his face somehow. That's a super nitpick. Shut the fuck up, me. <laughs> Okay, so I'm no fucking sword doctor or anything, but it seems like Sokka gets disarmed here by having his sword kind of just pushed away from him. That's a pretty pedestrian effort, even for a novice Sokka. When P and Dao unblindfolds Sokka here, you can see him just toss it up and effortlessly loop it around his sword. That was dope. In battle, you only have an instant to take everything in. A lot of behind the scenes knowledge on this one. I don't look anything up in advance for these videos, but I might as well share what I know. So this waterfall that Sokka is going to try and paint is actually based off a real waterfall in Iceland, like almost one to one. Sometimes it even has a rainbow. I'm finished. With that said, it's a little weird that Sokka's painting is completely devoid of any waterfall at all, right? Uh, Sokka. Uh. Concentrate on what you're doing. <clears throat> Fucking got him. This shot even has a lion turtle right up in your face. Manipulate them to my advantage. Oh! Oh my god, Sokka's jacked. Like, that's rivaling the size of the boulder that Aang carried, which, if you'll recall, we did the math and determined that it was... It was quite heavy, actually. We find out that P and Dao is a member of the White Lotus at the end of the episode, but there's actually some White Lotus imagery throughout the episode as well. Like this design he has on the floor of his sparring area. That's a White Lotus. Why is this dude eating a rock? We're starting from here. No, we're over on this island. You noodle brains don't know what you're doing. This is a great episode for Sokka. Not only do we get to see him actually improving himself, we actually do get to see what he means to the group and the role he fills. It's just another one of those things that could have been easily overlooked, but this show was obviously made with so much effort and love. Of course they thought to do that. You've had a good first day of training. That's the one thing I really don't like about this episode. That was one day? Sokka only trains with P and Dao for two days? Are you serious? And he made all of that progress? This is definitely a weak point. But I don't blame this episode entirely. I blame the Painted Lady for setting up the dumb time crunch that this episode obviously still had a sort of respect since it's literally the next episode. Give Sokka a week with P and Dao at least. Then it feels impactful. Two days feels too short to really learn anything meaningful. Fucking Painted Lady. Master. Would it be possible for me to leave and bring back a special material for my sword? I wouldn't have it any other way. I love P and Dow, dude. How'd they make this guy so likable? What's their deal? I don't know. They missed you or something. I didn't care. This episode does have the only other hints at Toph kind of liking Sokka, but it doesn't go anywhere, so I don't care. I miss Sokka. They missed you or something. I didn't care. Who's this? Oh, these are my friends. Just other good Fire Nation folks. How'd you get this giant boulder all the way up the hill? Oh, my friend here, he, he just carried it. It's no big deal. That kid over there is the Avatar, I bet. Sokka's such a fucking man. I love it. Look at this dude. Oh, it's a full moon too. Who would have thought? We got some more White Lotus decals in the background here. I saw a heart as strong as a lion turtle and twice as big. This is the second time lion turtles are mentioned by name. The last time was in the library. Hey, look at these weird lion turtle things. You showed something beyond that. Creativity, versatility, 
intelligence. I kind of tear up a little bit at this speech. I don't know why. I think everyone can kind of see themselves a little bit in Sokka in this episode. And I think that's what makes this episode so great and why it's a fan favorite and part of why Sokka is a fan favorite too. I am not worthy. I'm not who you think I am. I'm not from the Fire Nation, I'm from the Southern Water Tribe. I love this line because Sokka doesn't realize that what he's saying, being truthful right now, is part of what makes him worthy. He's a good person, he's humble, he's obviously grown a great respect for his master in this short amount of time, and you can just feel it, it's incredible. <laughs> Katara's stance is up here again, kind of similar to the stance that Paku taught them back in Season 1. Meanwhile, Aang takes a stance that's somewhat similar to one we saw Toph use in our debut episode. Pretty cool. You used to be the pride of the Fire Nation, our top general, the dragon of the West. Now look at you. Look what you've become. Awesome writing that the guard says, look what you've become, just before Iroh reveals his massive fucking gains. Look at him! Oh, this gets me so fired up. You can see this cloth fall out from under Iroh's robe because he wants to keep the illusion that he's a fat old man to the guardsmen and not this hulking tank that he's built himself into. I gotta go do some sit-ups, man. Excellent. Using your superior agility against an older opponent. Smart. This fight is really cool. It's a really good feeling to hear that Sokka has good instincts on what to do in a fight, and to hear Pian Dao praise him. You could argue that it kind of ruins the surprise that Pian Dao wasn't seriously attacking Sokka, but did anyone really think that with how chill Pian Dao has been? I don't think so, so I think it's fine. I also love that throughout this fight, Sokka is just scrambling and freaking out while everything that Pian Dao does is fluid and clearly mastered and almost stylish at some points. That's an awesome way to get a skill gap across without having to cut away to your other characters commenting on the fight like so many other action-based shows do. You let the action do the talking, and that makes for a good fight. You can hear Pian Dao actually spit out some of the dirt Sokka threw at him. I don't know why, but I think that's a really nice touch. There's really that one twig there. Really? Why? Why did there have to be a stepping on a twig moment to top off this fight? It's still an awesome fight, but it's kind of a silly way to end it. Wait, what? You might want to think of a better Fire Nation cover name. Try Lee. There's a million Lees. There's a million Lees. There's, 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 there's Lee Lee. The way of the sword doesn't belong to any one nation. Knowledge of the arts belongs to us all. Man, Pian Dao spits out some Iroh level gems. I wish this guy was in the show more often. The master wanted you to have this as something to remember him by. It's a pie show tile. A white lotus. Huh. What does it mean? I have no idea. I really like how they paste out the White Lotus stuff. It's mentioned just so often where you almost forget about it, but then there's another little hint. It keeps it very interesting and makes it seem more like an awesome reveal rather than an ass pole when it comes up in the finale. And you'll probably notice that the door has some White lotus -y decals in this shot as well. Tough, I thought you might like this, since you've probably never had a chance to bend Space Earth before. Sweet! Amongst the shapes Toph makes here is the logo for Nickelodeon, the original channel that Avatar aired on. This episode is awesome. I love this episode. The messaging is great, some real feel-good stuff, and I love the philosophy that P and Dao brings to swordplay. It's not just a physical art. There's also the Iroh pseudo-training montage into revealing he's a complete fucking unit. Amazing moments throughout the episode. It's just solid all the way around. Sure, most of the gang takes a backseat for most of it, but Sokka takes a backseat for a lot of episodes himself. So I think giving us one to really focus on Sokka wasn't just warranted, it was almost needed. I know this one is a fan favorite, and for good reason. I'm on the exact same wavelength. Before the patron shoutouts, I gotta mention this. Now, I'm always getting comments on what my opinions are on the Dragon Prince, which is the show that's the spiritual successor to Avatar. Well, I'm actually in a video where I talk about it extensively over on Fate Views' channel. We talk about the entire show top to bottom, and have a section where we just talk about it and compare it to Avatar at the end. It's a really good video, and I'm super happy to be a part of it. To watch it, it's the first link at the top of the description. Go check it out and subscribe to Fate Views. Patron shoutouts, if you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Gotta give a shoutout to my don't tiers. That's right, Agent Rhino, Lou Carrera, and Zumpy. They're still hanging around somehow. Were they born with so much money? Did they invest wisely? Did they unearth some ancient hidden treasure? Who knows? Perhaps one of each. Regardless, thank you very much, guys. Shoutouts, of course, to my otherwise top patrons, Anthony Celesu, who was directly related to both Nikola Tesla and Arnold Schwarzenegger, brains and brawn. Donnie Snow. 
Snow, who built a prison just so he could get a prison tattoo. Elder Zendenthus, who can recite Lincoln Park's entire lyrical history in one breath. Etc. who doesn't need to stop, drop, and roll when on fire, they can just think the flames out. Kennedy Stapleton, who bred the fastest sloth in the world. Mandatory Sin, who was separated from his other octuplet siblings at birth so they wouldn't feel bad about being less good looking. Max Lewandowski, who I saw crush the raw ingredients for a muffin in his hand, and when he opened his fist, there was just a muffin there. Mike the Wizard, who was secretly hacked the Pentagon and replaced the nuclear codes with LOL69. Nick Kaipanen, whose wardrobe is more expensive than the United States' debt. Sad Wallanoises, who found a $100 bill on the ground and immediately gave it to a children's hospital. Skylos, who's actually 22% goblin DNA. Might explain the temporary talking to frogs thing. Tiago Nascimento, who was the first to get 99 woodcutting. Varunda, who gave Elon the idea for that electric car thing, I swear. Wolfman Dan, who got that name by actually running a wolf down, tackling it, and taming it. And Will Schmidt, who meditated through the last three centuries, and well, now he's here. And of course, my other top patrons, Andrew Edwards, Artem Korolev, Buddha Jacker, Caps Lock, Charlie Rock Quigley, Daniel Ward, Eric Barney, etc. Fetch me something gay. Fritz Sullivan, Jess, John, Keith Clausen, Sean Martin, and you freaking nerd. And of course, my god analyzers, Aiden Guerra, Alex Fritz, Austin Gallup, Be My Valentine, Bingo Dingo, Cabbage Gal, Canon Corpse, Kevin Yagi, Chase Brignac, Chris Dolmeth, Code Canut, David Carlisle, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Dr. Uwu, Distent, Earth 2 John, Eleanor Rose, Epic Goomba, Eric Ross, X Meyer, Ginny from the Block, Glintlock, Homie Juan Kenobi, Hype King, Jared Hagen, Jay Lambo, Jeremy Rubenstein, Jimbo, John Ajaka, Kadax, Keon Gilliland, Lady Serena, Lehman Russ, Matthew Stargell, Mr. Airborne, Mitchell Gobrecht, Mortius 007, Nicholas Abbott, No Clue, Ock Nick TV, Omar, Parker, I Hardly Know Her, Peyton Mims, Peter Bayron, Sergeant Painkillers, Shadow Fox Nero, Skyler JB, Spaghetti Host, Steinwan, Super Snipper, Tentabat, The Rainy Man on Healy's, Travis Chestnut, Triad Juice, and Whales Red. Next up is the beach. Weird one. Good one? We'll see.